Ladies and gentlemen, this is Internet Personality Vangelis here with a look at a pre-production copy of Gigapower's debut piece, HQ-03 Gatour. Another player in the unofficial Dinobots field, Gigapower are also going for a masterpiece intended take on the gray and gold prehistoric bruisers. This is a pre-production copy, which means it's not a final production copy, it's a pre-production copy made before finalized full production has been finalized. Thus, it's not final, it's pre-production. I want to lay that out with subtle and expedient clarity right up front that this is a pre-production copy of the figure before it is moved into final mass production. By the way, this is the metallic version, which includes a few extra flame accessories and metallic paint. There will also be a chrome version without the flame parts or metallic paint, but with gold chrome. Gatours, a snarling stegosauric dinosaur robot, and his alt mode is a robot dinosaur. Possibly even a robot stegosaurus. Gigapower have decided to draw more inspiration from Snarl's G1 toy rather than his G1 cartoon appearances, and one place that is all the better for it is this dino mode. It's a high-backed, plate-racked, four-legged football of cybernetic muscle mass. He's got the huge hump of the G1 toy, but wears it rather well in playing up the massiveness factor, to the point of dwarfing most of the Datsuns and Lambos that he'd walk amongst when trying to maintain his... disguise. Also, by going toy-centric, the dino head looks a whole lot meaner than the squished lizard thing that we saw in the old cartoon. There's a little bit of, like, mush on the tip of his nose, but I've been told by Gigapower that that's going to be ironed out by the time this hits production. The metallic version of Gutter uses metallic paint! Tons of it! All the gold is delightfully sparkly, and there are a whole lot of little detail paint apps that are cleanly applied and pop a whole lot, and all the gray has got a metallic sheen as well. The finish of this figure practically glows under even the most basic lighting setups. I have also been told by Gigapower that the pre-production sample I got had its paint sprayed due to the time crunch, and the final product's parts are going to be coated and baked, and thus not easily scratched. So if you think this looks good, apparently the final production version is going to be even more lusterful and durable. Gutter's stego mode is also a lot more poseable than one might think. The jaw can open, revealing legit sharp teeth that I actually hurt my finger on once, and a goofy little pair of cannons within. But the head can also look from side to side. Just a bit. And it can even look up. Just a bit. But goddamn, that is cool to see. Especially given that all this stuff, like, splits in half. The front legs are attached via, I think think extremely limited ball joints that mostly afford forward and backward motion. The knees and ankles are both on extremely tight ratchet joints, which is great considering all the die-cast stego plate weight up top. There's a toe joint as well for those who are into that, and get this, friggin' ankle tilt! Dinosaur ankle tilts, it is 2015, yo. The rear legs are gutters robot arms and thus end up with some extra motion in all the major places. There's also less of a knee joint, but the two axis ankles are still present back here. Finally, the tail has a fairly inconsequential amount of swish from left to right. The range isn't big, but getting motion in both the neck and the tail, two thick parts that full-on split up in transformation, is impressive nonetheless. Exclusive to the metallic version are some flexible rubber flame slippers. These are really durable, solid to slip onto gutters, dino feet, and nearly glowing in their translucent flamey orangey red. They look great, though I'm not entirely sure why Gutter is literally setting fire to whatever he's stepping on. I guess he's just the hot stuff. There's a peg hole on either of Gutter's rear legs, which allows for the storage of either of his ranged weapons, a missile launcher and a cannon rifle gun. Explosion-footed artillery Stegosaurus, ahoy! Oh yeah, for the Super G1 Toy Faithful, there are a pair of semi-clear plates that cover Gutter's neck and skull to pay even deeper homage to the 80s action figure. While I appreciate the attention to detail, I don't feel as excited about this as some folks in the discussion threads. But for what these pieces are, they do a fine enough job, so if you're one of those devotees to the order of transparent stegosaur parts, I've got good news for you. The skull plate's a bit loose, but I've been informed by Gigapower that this is a known issue that should be corrected in final production. Gutur transforms surprisingly simply given what I expected going in, and it's also extremely close to the original G1 Snarl conversion, especially at the start. I do wish the front dino legs had more security tabs or pegs, but I can't deny that they stay solidly in place once they're within their respective divots. The biggest addition to the G1 Snarl scheme is here, where the split dino head, neck, and underbelly kinda suck in and spiral together inside the robot boots. 
I really thought this was going to be more complicated than it actually is. The engineering's quite natural. The boot sole and its deploying connecting piston fuse a more natural robot foot together underneath, once again doing some clever design work that's dead easy to do on the user end. Gutter's rear dino legs complete their destiny of becoming robot arms with a logical series of movements. One thing I'll call out here is that some of those door flaps can be tight to move, at least on a fresh pre-production copy. The golden dino legs do a good job of curling up into the forearms, too. I thought the final motions of tail splitting and plate back folding would have some extra complications for the sake of aesthetics, but nope. The movements are just really well designed. Pull, swing, fold, flip. Gutter is all roboticized for bipedal action. And here's where Gigapower's aesthetic direction takes hold of the robot mode. The G1 toy look takes a lot of precedence between stuff like having a black cod piece and visible dino limbs on his legs. There are also a few toy referential deco choices like the coloration on the hips or the blue strips on the fronts of his shins. I, yeah, I'm kind of focusing on his crotch and his legs. Whatever, man, don't judge me. All that referential minutiae aside, Gutter is also a big, bad, beefy, bruiser bastard of a prehistoric powerhouse robot man. That chest. Them muscles. His Stegosaurus backpack is also really cool to see rendered at this size, and with so much extra surface detail. My favorite aspect revealed by the robot mode is how all the newly visible black parts have got a dead, flat, matte finish, in direct contrast to all the shiny gray and gold. It gives Gutter's robot mode some bang and life, and pumps up the high-end feel of the toy's visual finish. I'm a little biased towards matte black in general, but I think it looks way more professional than glossy black plastic. I've still not decided if I also would have wanted a matte finish on the red as well, since its own finish falls between the matte and metallics, almost like a mixing agent for the two extremes. The head sculpt's alright, though there's something about the face that feels like I've caught him perpetually in the middle of collecting his thoughts. There are options, though. Pop the head off the ball joint, eventually, and you've got a whole second ANGER head to put in its place. I like this face sculpt a lot more, though I'd prefer to keep the blue eyes and silver forehead. Well, guess what? These heads can pop apart for the sake of facilitating all of that. Basically, the face sculpt, eye color, and forehead color are all interchangeable as per your own personal taste. And the part that makes me kind of relieved is that it's all done via tabs and pegs, eliminating the need for a screwdriver. And this stuff is all tight. I've not had any issues with heads splitting or faces falling off whatsoever. Gutter's missile launcher can deploy its peg and plug into one of the two screw holes on the back of his torso for some of that shoulder-mounted rocket launcher action. This, in theory, would give it a little bit of up-and-down tilt, but it's so entrenched in stego plates, it doesn't get much out of that joint. His gun can store on one of those screw holes too, if you like. For actually shooting it, the handle has a tab into the palm connection that is super stiff and solid. Gutter's sword uses the same kind of connection, but includes a separate clear plastic piece that allows it to make use of either of those rearward screw holes for robot mode storage, too. There's some waggle in the way the piece clips onto the sword handle, but the weapon doesn't actually come loose and fall off without a healthy tug. You can attach any of these things to Gutter's forearms, by the way, though none of them really look natural when mounted there to me. A surprising addition to the gun and sword is a light-up feature. Each weapon uses a pair of LR-66 batteries, four in total, to light up red. The gun's tip blazes up all nice and proper. I dig it. The sword's still in development, right down to how its blade is assembled. The blade's actually going to use hypersonic welding when it goes into full production for a seamless seal between its two halves. Hopefully the LED will be powered up a little too, as the one on my pre-production copy is kind of weak. The last two flame parts from the Metallic version's exclusive stockpile include this huge, awesome, flaming sword effect piece. Despite its rubbery feel, there's a well-cut seam line inside that fits around the sword's blade, and the whole assembly pegs together quite solidly to set Gutter's weapon the hell on fire. Imaginary fire. The other effect part is a blast for the gun barrel of his gun, which takes advantage of the LED function to pipe even more crimson light through its fiery translucent form. To see a light-up feature extend itself into an add-on effect part is something that makes me kind of happy. Before I get into, like, the, the joints, I want to talk about a moving part that, like, surprised me. So I was messing around with this guy, and I was like, doo 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 oh, uh. So yeah, I didn't know this happened. I'd missed this, basically, up until I accidentally 
flip those open. I didn't even notice the pins up there. When it was closed, I didn't see the seam line. I thought it was just part of the design of this guy, so boom, there's like stuff in there. And I don't know, you can get this part coming down. This part, by the way, this thing, oh, is super tight. Hurts my finger when I get it out, but I don't know. That kind of looks to me like a, a weird, like, substitute diaclone cockpit of some kind. I don't know what could go in there, and I mean, like, when his head's folded down, it's taken up most of the space, but I thought that was kind of cool. Anyway, as for posability, you all saw that his neck is uh, attached using a ball socket connection, uh, and it turns left and right pretty happily. Doesn't really do anything else. I, I mean, the ball socket police are on the way, I guess. The exciting life of living by an off-ramp. Anyway, he, uh, he can't really look up all that far. He can look up about that far. And that's about it. That's all the nodding he does. He doesn't really get much tilt either. This is mostly a side-to-side -side joint. Although the platform that his head is on for the transformation can fold in, you can use that to get a little bit of downward look. But, uh, yeah, he's, he's not got a ton of neck range uh, on that setup. His shoulders are a two-step... Uh, universal style joint. Uh, universal style is my catch-all for it moves in two axes. Goes forward and backwards with a very soft ratchet. Uh, so soft, like these are the detents, but you can very easily just put it between detents and it doesn't fight back all that much. It's like a kind of s mixture of a friction and a ratchet joint. And uh, the thing I like about that is it offers some security. Uh, if, if things seem to get maybe a bit loose over the years, there will still be these hard lock points to rely on. Uh, the outward motion is a much harder uh, ratchet that's actually up here. And uh, it's got a bit of squeak to it right now. I don't know if that will be fixed by the time this goes to mass production. If you move it up all the way, it does start to push out the transformation joint. And uh, that's something that... Uh, is not too dangerous, but be aware of it. If it does come all the way out, it might start moving instead of the actual shoulder. And, uh, like, this thing moves down here and locks in for dino mode up here and locks in for robot mode. So, uh, there's, there's a lot of stuff moving up here, but generally the range is fine. There's also a bicep swivel, just a straight-up friction joint. The elbow is ratcheted, though. Three clicks, and it's... It's not super possible to get it to stop in between any of those clicks. Uh, so hopefully you're happy with uh, what's there. It's just a single joint, but it does bend a full 90 degrees. So uh, I'm more or less satisfied with this. His wrists are straight up swivels uh, that go like that, you know, like a swivel. His hands are uh, full of joints. Every finger is articulated. And these things are a mixture of joint types. The thumb is on a ball socket joint up here. That's it. The rest of these fingers have all got the same articulation. There's a friction joint, like a clip-on friction joint for the mid uh, knuckle, and then the base knuckle is on a shared pin. Uh, it's shared, but that doesn't mean that you know these all have to move in tandem. They can still move individually. The mid knuckle joints on the pre-production versions, as you can see, they're a little bit loose on their own. It is the weird thing. On their own, they're kind of loose, but then when they're all together, uh, they push against each other enough to uh, to be happy enough. Giga Power told me before this got here, that's one of the things they are specifically going to be fixing before this goes to mass production. So don't worry about the mid-knuckle finger joints. Uh, as far as I am told, uh, down at the factory level, they are going to have that solved before this goes out to retailers. The waist is a simple swivel, and it's just a friction swivel. It might look like a ratchet, but that's only because it's so frigging tight that it's kind of hard to get. Like, once you get it moving... Then you can start positioning it a bit more easily, but it uh, it's sticky. Like it'll 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 hold tightly, and then you gotta really go and then get it going. And uh, it's got full range; nothing impedes it. I thought that maybe this stuff over here would get in the way, but it seems to be fine. So the hips are on uh, kind of ratcheting universal system. It's your classic potato chip ripple here, and then a much softer but still effective uh, buttery detent uh, out this way. The skirt stuff. Uh, there's a forward one, a backward one, and a sideways one. This stuff is all great for, you know, getting out of the way of your joint and letting you have your full range of motion, but there's one thing you should not do. It's very natural to push these in all the way until they stick together. If you do that, they're actually in the way of any kind of natural flow with the joint. Um, it's best to take them and move them out just a little bit, like all three of them. Uh, that way there's enough room for the boxiness of the thigh to flow under them when you're opposing it. And uh, it's just something to be aware of and to be conscious of. 
because uh, it is natural, I find, for myself, and I'm sure other collectors to just squeeze all that pelvis stuff together. Leave a little bit of air in there, and you'll have an easier time with this dude. Uh, there is a thigh swivel up here. Uh, it's a little bit limited because all this box up here is rotating. In fact, for the transformation, when you're swiveling at 360, you've got to move it out here so there's enough clearance. If you're down here, it actually does not go uh, the full 360. It goes a natural range, but if for some reason you want this guy to have his legs swiveled backwards in s some weird pose you're thinking of, you crazy deviant, then uh, you'll need to move it out here first. His knees are a single joint that work pretty well. Super tight ratchets. And I was wondering if all the mush in here from the folded up uh, dino head and neck would get in the way, but it doesn't. Uh, it's pretty nice. By the way, I don't know if uh, I made it clear, but I kind of like how they use the space in here for all that. It's, uh, it's pretty impressive. So, those knees are mega tight. And uh, definitely give this guy a heavy sense of stability. His feet have got their own joints as well. Uh, there is a weird system here where all this stuff moves on its own. There's a ball socket connection between this and this, and then from the transformation we've got this like piston connection from here to here. And uh, that piston has a swivel, like a cut swivel, right there. So if you move this guy's foot down, it's a lot easier to do this. You can twist this, and now he's got a hell of ankle tilt, and then all this stuff has moved in tandem with it, and if you want, you can swivel that with it as well. Uh, it's a very cool setup down there. It gives him... Like, he already was not going to fall down, but now he's super duper not going to fall down. So posability-wise, I'm pretty much digging this. Uh, gutter is uh, not, like, acrobatically posable, but for what I need out of a gigantic dino bot, uh, I think he serves his functions pretty well. This isn't even really a, a point of articulation so much as something that amuses me, but thanks to the transformation, you can take the uh, chunks of backpack here and flap them around and actually if you don't want to use the weapon storage stuff that uses those two screw holes uh, you can take these and kind of uh, tilt them back like this I think this looks really cool uh, it, it, like I said it nullifies some weapon storage that I'm not really using anyway and I like I don't mind this look but there's something more dynamic about this to me from certain angles anyway it's options um, from the tail posability of the dynamo you can also fold this stuff a bit if you want uh, anyway that's posability. I think it's good on this guy. It's uh, it's solid, that's the thing. There's just like, there's user-friendly ratcheting everywhere. Uh, there's no use of friction joints in load-bearing areas, which I'm really happy to see. Uh, Scoria's shoulders being a friction joint in this direction is something I super was not into even after I got the shoulder fix. But we also need to see what this guy looks like next to things, and there's, there's an obvious place to start off with this, I'm sure. Time to have us a little Hikaksuru no Jidai! So this is Gutter next to Fans Toys Scoria, which is my currently my only Fans Toys Dinobot. And uh, as you can see, Gutter's he's bigger, but having put him next to him, and I mean having seen the photos that Gigapower put up as well, my initial worry was this guy was going to look cartoonishly enormous next to one of these guys. Uh, and I kind of like these guys' size. However, he doesn't look cartoonishly huge, he just looks slightly bigger. And I'm kind of okay with this, even having just these two on display with each other, I think it kind of works. Snarl looks like a big man, and I always thought of him as a big man with a sword and crazy stegosaurus plates, but I think it looks okay. And uh, going off of Scoria, we've also got Masterpiece Grimlock with his Scoria shoes, and you know, again, it looks fine, I think. Um, this all depends on your belief of how big Snarl should be. Uh, do you think Snarl's supposed to be smaller than everyone else or on the same size? I don't know, but I, I think this looks okay. Um, you put these guys together as a unit, maybe have Snarl stand in the back, and it seems okay to me. Um, I'm not as picky or devoted to certain aesthetics with Masterpiece, which I, I, I believe sets me somewhat uh, into the freak area of the Masterpiece collecting community, but I think it looks alright. Like, from, from many angles, uh, this, this seems survivable to me. And if Gigapower end up doing uh, a couple more guys, like a, you know, a slag of their own, for instance, who's as big as he is, uh, I, I think it could be pretty cool too. But Gutter is proof of concept that something that big doesn't necessarily look terrible. Gigapower stayed in the unofficial transforming robot press throughout much of 2014. And after all that time, the main question I had going into their first figure release was, can they make a solid toy? Going off of Gutter, and a pre-production version at that, I think they can. 
He's got a very high-end fit and finish, strong and solid joints, and that unmistakable feel of a survivable handful of mechanical toy muscle. Whatever they do next, which is probably going to be more Dinobots, I admit, they've now set a strong bar of quality to live up to. I once had misgivings about the sheer size they were going for, but perhaps with the advent of Masterpiece Ultra Magnus, Gutter's girth makes a whole lot more sense in person. As for the comparison that the loudest voices will demand, on a basic level of construction quality and in-hand feel, I'd say Giga Power is easily on par with fans' toys. There are stacks of aesthetic differences, the least of which being fans' toys going for a G1 cartoon look while Giga Power appears to be paying much more tribute to the G1 toys. There are no in-hand reports of Fans Toys' own take on Snarl, called Sever, as of this recording, but theirs has hidden dino legs and cartoon coloration in all its promo pics, so for now the aesthetic delineation remains constant. Between Scoria and Gutter, they're pretty much physically on par. Aesthetic taste is going to vary from person to person, but the bare bones of the matter is that Gutter can stand next to Scoria without any question. I am more impressed by Scoria's hiding of the dino legs inside his robot legs, but I'm also more impressed by Gutter's often heavier, ratchetier, and stronger joints, as well as his landmark of a dinosaur mode. Comparisons aside, I'm fairly impressed by Giga Power's first outing into transforming robot action figure production. The price is steep, but between the meaty joints, gorgeous finish, and hefty mass, I feel like it's on par with similar items in the $200 monetary bracket. If you don't need company purism or united aesthetics on your shelf, this guy looks pretty okay with the other available masterpiece stuff that's out there. If you just think Snarl is cool, then you're probably going to have a great time with Gutter. And if you think all this unofficial Dinobot fever is complete nonsense, then I've got to thank you for your morbid curiosity in watching this video up till the end. Anyway, this has been Internet Personality Vangelis, and I hope this video has helped fuel some of the fire of the unofficial Masterpiece Dinobot conversation. 2015 looks to be the year that brings the discussion to a climax, as more of these figures actually come out. So if you're a regular knuckle-cracking, spitfire denizen of the various mega-threads, be cool and don't try to spill blood in the name of your chosen third-party church, okay?